This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rushing, and I am doing this program live. If you want to give us a call, it is a live program. So if you want to give us a call, it's well, we'll go the numbers over and over. So just grab a pencil or something. But I'm broadcasting from the Veterans Center in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, just off the uh, University of Southern Mississippi campus. It's got a big special event that we'll talk about a little bit later. But if you want to give us a call, we've got the lines wide open just to talk about gardening. This beautiful weekend, uh, in between rains, not too hot, not too cold, everything's just right for getting stuff started out in the garden and uh, we got plenty we can talk about so anyway uh before we get to our calls i want to say hey to java how you doing man man i'm doing good i'm just like you uh enjoying the well i'm i'm inside uh you're gonna you're gonna be outside <laughs> and this is is this event that you are uh, participating in today is this like a arbor day type of thing it's arbor day and you know this past week was uh was uh uh uh, oh, I forget the name of it. The uh, uh, Nature Day. Uh, uh, <laughs> Let me look it up. <laughs> Earth Day. Earth Day. Earth Day. There we go. <laughs> Earth Day. Arbor Day. And uh, what, what's happened down here is the Daughters of the American Revolution. These are, are women who are, who are celebrating and supporting, uh, you know, celebrating the American Revolution, which is 250 years next year anyway they planted a, an american elm tree they're dedicated they got a nice plaque gonna have a whole bunch of folks down here but uh they had me come up because they've got a pollinator garden by it i got my pickup truck puller it right beside it it's beautiful and they've got chairs set out so anybody wants to come on i'm gonna start talking around 10 20 or so so 10 30 uh you know somewhere somewhere well after the program's over uh and it's just off of um off the University of Southern Mississippi campus. Uh, so I'll give a little details, but if anybody interested nearby South Central Mississippi want to drive on over, it'll be a real pretty event. Got my pickup truck and it's a lot of stuff on the back to talk about. So Now, anyway, Felder, yeah. do you know that you said this, the American Revolution will be, what, 250 years next year? Yeah. Yep. Now, you know centennial is the word for 100 years do you know the word for 250 years? No, qu- qu- quadricential. Quarter <laughs> millennial. Quarter millennial, okay. Quarter well, you know, millennial. Yep, yeah, and you know, and by the way, Java, even though I'm here talking about gardening, and I got plenty of stuff to, to share, we've got a, a, my truck is loaded with stuff, uh, including some pretty unusual things. Uh, I want to brag just a little bit. Uh, my family has been here, uh, my. My ancestors have been here in North America since 1635, long time, and 1730s, and I mean, a long, long time. And uh, we fought on both sides of the America Rifle, and you know, my sweetheart is British, and she feels pretty comfortable today because their folks are real, real nice. <laughs> but anyway, my son, Ira, is the 11th direct line rushing to serve in American military service. And right now he's deployed overseas. He's in Eastern Germany training Ukrainian soldiers. That's major uh, IRA rushing. So anyway, 11 direct gen- – the first two generations were British, but that counts. <laughs> I, I, I guess if you want to put it in a line like that, yeah, it counts. <laughs> yeah, you know, American military service. So uh, anyway, that's going to be a lot of fun. It starts uh, – their their program starts a little bit after 10, you know, with uh, a dedication of the flag and uh, Pledge of Allegiance and, and all that. But uh, if anybody wants to come, we're right off of uh, the Main Street coming into town, Hardy Street. We're on the western edge of the uh, University of Mississippi campus at the Veterans Center. So anyway, let's go down to Mobile and see what – what John is up to. Morning, John. How are you today? Excuse me, Montgomery, uh, not Mobile. Uh, I, I'm doing well. I'm actually on the road to Montgomery from Mobile. Okay. Uh, but but I've got a question. Uh, I added a lime tree uh, to what I call my citrus grove. Uh, about oh, well, I think I put it in about four weeks ago. It's about oh, I'm guessing three and a half feet tall when I put it in. Uh-huh. Uh, in the last uh, last week or so, it's come up with some flowers on the, uh, the little branches. Can I take those off 
or just let them go and develop what they will develop? I, I would let it, you know, a lot of people say, well, you need to take the fruit off the first year because it's treasure the plant. But come on, this is home gardening, not commercial production. What I would do is I would leave them on, first of all, because they're pretty and they smell nice, and that's part of growing them. Uh, but also, if and the pollinators like them. And if you end up with more than two or three uh, lemons actually forming on it, go ahead and step off all but two or three. And, uh, and okay. then I think that that would be fine. And by the way, don't overwater your tree. A lot of people think they need to water a lot. It's really better to water deep and then let the surface dry out of, you know, two or three inches deep so the new roots will grow down deep, and that will help them in the long run. So don't, right. don't keep it too wet. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I found out uh, a year or so ago with an orange tree I had in there, when it get, gets too wet, the oranges explode. Yeah, that's right. I tell you something you can do just in case they don't make it is when it gets some size, and we get your sharpie pen and draw smiley faces on them, sort of like you see on the on the on the orange juice can. <laughs> okay. You think I'm kidding? I ain't kidding. Sometimes that's the best we get. Sometimes that's all we get. <laughs> anyway, have, have fun. And appreciate it, man. All right, thank you. You bet. Okay, now let's head up to Madison, Mississippi. Elaine, how are you this morning? I am. I'm fair to Midland. How are you? So far, so good. Not so bad, I should say. What's okay, up? Okay, so I did. Did he give you a heads up on my lengthy question, or should I? Should I? <laughs> well, just don't keep it too long, but give give us the highlights of it. All right. So I don't want to eat up your time. Um, yesterday, I got on a webinar that was uh, produced by a guy up in, in Nebraska. And he was talking, of course, they're prairie up there, but he was talking about things that you can plant in the shade that are native plants. And I've yeah. got some mature trees in the front yard that have, you know, I'm, I'm, t- I'm tired of fighting the lawn. You know, right. I'm going to let that, you know, I'm going to let the lawn win. Right. Uh, I want to uh, plant some things out there. He, he, his approach is set out a, a sedge matrix and then plug in your, you know, your um, perennials in between there. Right, right. And I just I need some, some suggestions on what will grow here. My okay. other issue is I just had my foundation jacked for the third time, and they completely trashed my front beds. And most of those plantings were in such rough shape from the weather that we've had. I would like to go in there with that same approach, half of the, half the front's in shade, half of it in sun. I was thinking, and I noticed you were talking about pollinator gardens i want to put a pollinator patch on the sunny end and you know then plant shade plants on the other end right. so that's right. what i'm looking for suggestions right. of what varieties and oh, where okay. can i source them oh okay well, for, first of all forget what anybody in nebraska has to say about gardening because they do not grow the same plants at all but the concept is good no matter where you live you know anywhere in the in the world uh, so we need to find plants that 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 not only uh, grow in the shade in Mississippi, but take our hot, humid summer nights, uh, the drought we have, the heavy, heavy rains in the springtime. There's a lot of different conditions, each of which can affect the, how different plants grow. Too much water, not enough water, uh, fickle winters, hot, dry summer days, humid, all that kind of stuff. And we do have some good suggestions for these plants. Matter of fact, uh, Mississippi State uh, has a publication on this. If you go to MSU Cares dot com uh, and just type in in the search box uh shade gardens uh you'll come up with a really cool little publication that lists some of the best plants for us uh, a lot of them are native a lot of them are not native but i'll be honest with you even though i passed president of the native plant society they're not the only plants in town we have some terrific plants uh that grow in the shade that are not native that are also good for wildlife and pollinators now, i can give you a long list of them i could throw out names like elysium and and uh uh uh, the uh, just, well, I'm, there's so many that just came up. I can't know anywhere to start. If you'll send me an email, I've got a list of some of the best plants you can put in your garden uh, that are good for Mississippi and good for pollinators. And all you have to do is go to to my uh, 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 to, to my blog. It's not a it's not an email. It's feldrushing dot blog. Uh, it just, it has some things that email me. I can send you a list. Also, your extension service there has got some good ideas. So uh, this weekend, uh, tomorrow, they're going to have a, a really nice plant sale at Monell Gardens in Jackson. 
they've got a bunch of native plants, a bunch of pollen, a bunch of shade plants, and people who can can give you some good ideas. Uh, that'll be at Minel Gardens uh, first thing in the morning. So uh, anyway, that's the start. But anyway, the idea is to to mix things that like the shade that will bloom in the shade, and there's not that many uh, that'll do well without you having to do a whole bunch of care. Okay, that's that's yeah, that's that's my aim. Okay, well, you know, as far as what plants, you know, can't even begin to get in on this radio program. But if you email me, we'll take it from there. Okay, I appreciate you. Okay, there was something else you had a uh, uh, question. Oh, oh, your flower bed. It's, it's, yeah, a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't realize sometimes you just have to have to have your hair. You have to have a makeover on your haircut. Sometimes we have to have makeovers in the yard. It's okay to have to every now and then almost start over from scratch, pull old plants out, work up the dirt, plant some new stuff. So this is not that unusual. Uh, down through history, people have reworked flower beds every few years for for t- millions of people have done this. So it's not a negative thing. It's an opportunity to, to change things up like that, a new hairdo. Well, and it, I was forced into it because the foundation contractor completely trashed oh, yeah. what I said. Oh, 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 I understand. <laughs> I understand. I just had my I just had my house repainted, and uh, I had to go out when it was halfway too late to tell to get the uh, painters to take his ladder out of my my pee pads that I planted for my granddaughter. So I, mm-hmm. I get that, but anyway, you just got to keep up, keep, you know, pick up and keep going. Yeah, well, I, like I said, and I realized that when, you know, when you do things with perennials and that, you have to be very patient. It's going to take two or three years for it. Not, not necessarily. No, 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 not necessarily. There's a plant called Gara, G-A-U-R-A, uh, Gara, and uh, purple cone flowers. They, they they bloom this. You plant them in, and you can get them at, at, at Garden Works right down the road. For, you know where Garden Works is? I there, do. Matt, you're yeah, uh, they've got some terrific plants that are ready to go that will bloom this year, and they'll just get better and better every year. Okay, and I can plant, in other words, I can lay a sedge matrix down and then plant them in between. Uh, for, 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 forget the sedge matrix. Just stick a few sedges here and there. You know, the, the word matrix is a control thing. Just stick a few plants here and there. Make it kind of random. You know, he's talking about a big meadow type thing. I just finished a a conference uh, up in in Senatobia uh, with a bunch of scientists who are studying how to do meadows, wildflower meadows, and flower lawns. And uh, they don't do metrics; they just stick stuff out. That's the way it is done naturally. For, for, forget the the square foot gardening approach. Just plant stuff every which way and look more natural. And that way, if something dies, nobody can tell. Yeah. Well, this. <laughs> And I know yeah. there's going to be a third amount of mortality. <laughs> yeah. Well, and let me throw out one other thing. Uh, it, 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 we're going to move on. But one of the most important things you can do, especially in the shade garden, but even in a sunny garden, before you plant anything, put some kind of hard feature out there that, that says this is a special place. It could be a big log. It could be a stump. It could be a bird bath, a big urn. Uh, it could be an old chair, uh, a wagon wheel. But put something out there that, that creates a, a focal point all year and then plant stuff around that that's the first thing i would do is put some kind of hard feature out there to have something to look out there every year all year and then plants can come and go through the seasons around that but that's the first thing i would do yeah that's probably i need to relocate a bird bath that would be the there you go probably, there you go there you go put your put, association put, off my back <laughs> Put your bird bath out there and then take it from there. Forget that matrix stuff. That's so control oriented. We just want to have have a nice looking yard and have fun. Okay, sounds good. Okay, Elaine, thank you for calling. Sure thing. All righty, Java. That was uh, that was a good call. A lot of people yeah. want to do this kind of thing. Yeah, we've been rocking and rolling, um, and we haven't even taken our first break. But before we do, I want to say thank you to the sponsor of today's podcast episode, Vericosity Vein Center. Uh, we appreciate them for bringing us the podcast of this very episode. For more information, VeracosityVeinCenter.com. But um, before we take our first break, Felder, we do have a call from Hattiesburg. Wants to okay. talk Wants to talk about um, sequoia trees. Is this uh, Sabria? Okay. Hey, Sabria. Oh, yeah. Good morning. Howdy. Yes, sir. Good morning. How you all good doing? Mo- we're, we're doing fine. You, you, you sound so cheerful this morning. <laughs> well, it's a good morning. Yes, um, it is. You know what? I, 
I made a mistake. It's not sequoias, it's cedar. I have two, I actually have three large cedar uh, trees that are growing like in, in our yard. And right. they really took a beating from the drought. And I'm just concerned if I'm going to lose them. Is there something I can do to see how it might go? They're okay, well, tall. they're like 10 feet or so. Well, let me ask you a couple of things. First of all, are, are, are these native cedar trees or are they those what they call Leyland cypress trees that look like cedars? You know what? I'm not sure. Uh, they were here when we moved here, and they've been in place over 10 years. Okay. The reason I'm asking because our native cedar trees, uh, which you know, they, they, they never, you know, nothing bothers them. Uh, they're durable unless there's been some kind of root damage other than just a drought. You know, it takes a one, two, three punch to to hurt a cedar tree. Uh, Leland cypress, on the other hand, they look like cedars. Uh, the leaves are a little bit more ferny, and they're really, really sensitive to staying too wet, then too dry, then too wet, then way, way too dry, and then hot and dry. You know, they're they're a hybrid from plants that are native to California and Alaska. They're real popular, and they're fast-growing, and they're pretty, but they start browning out. So if you've got limbs and branches up high in the tree they are just turning brown, it's probably a Leland cypress. And uh, anyway, the, the bottom line, no matter what the tree is, there's really not much I can do if it happened in my own yard except just snip out the brown, and if what's left doesn't look good, just cut it down and plant something else. You know, there's, there's no treatment for it is what I'm saying once they start browning out. Okay, yeah, because it's pretty brown all the way through, and now it's starting to shrivel up. So I'm thinking I, I just want its last leg. I, I bet it's a Leyland Cypress. L e l e y l a n d Leyland Cypress. They're real popular. They've been popular for half a century, but I've been seeing nothing. But I was taught about their problems when I was studying them in, at Mississippi State decades ago. So anyway, they're all over the state. They're browning out. Not much you can do against it. Just cut out the brown stuff. Uh, although I will say okay. this, I, I lost a magnolia tree last year in the drought, a little dwarf magnolia tree, and I cut the branches back and stuck uh, different color wine bottles on it and have a climbing rose growing on it. Oh, how about that? Okay, that's creative. You know, like well, that. they say that that way I, I got arbor posts without having to, to dig holes. I just use the trees as arbor posts. Okay, okay, I can see that. They're really tall. They... Okay, so Leland, I see that. Okay. Right, L-E-Y-L-A-N-D. I bet you that's what it is. Okay. And they've been suffering with everybody, They're not just you. So don't yeah. feel bad. Just cut out the brown stuff and either stick bottles on the stems or replace them with something else. Okay. All right, thank you so much. You all have a okay. wonderful uh, day. Thank you. you. You you brought a lot of cheer to everybody. Thank you for your call. All righty, Java. And I'm down here at Hattiesburg, and when I get off the air, I'm giving a program. I'm at the Veterans Center, which is on 35th Avenue. It's on the western edge of USM campus off of Hardy Street. A lot of folks here, uh, the, the Daughters of the American Revolution are dedicating an, an American elm. they got a cool little pollinator garden. I brought some plants to put in their pollinator garden. So I'll be starting talking about 1030 from the back of my pickup truck. Hope to see some folks down here. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to take a real quick break. We're going to come back and talk a little bit more with you about what's going on or not in your own garden. Got the lines wide open. So give us a call, toll-free, 1-877-MPB-RING. We'll be right back with more of the Gestalt Gardener right after this. The 10-Minute Time Out is a mini podcast that brings Mississippi sports stories to life. Join me, Lacey Alexander, as I learn more about the teams, athletes, staff, and programs that make our state proud. One-on-one -on -one interviews with influential playmakers paint a clear picture for listeners of how Mississippi sports inspire and energize our community. New episodes released every other Friday on your favorite podcasting app. Just fell rushing, and me and Java and all the other folks at MTV, we welcome to this program. We call it the Gestalt Garden. And by the way, uh, I, I got to tell you this, Java, you won't believe this. What's you up? remember, you know, for the drive time, I used to come up with these weird little little gimmick things to, to give away. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I had a fella come up to me uh, the other day. I don't remember whether it's in Monroe, Louisiana, or Natchez, uh, but he came up and he said that he heard us talk about Felder's magic foo foo dust. You remember that? <laughs> it, it was a little bag of compost from a compost. I said it's magic, and you put it in your garden. He said that caused him to become a sustaining member. He's been a sustaining member for over ten years since then. Felder's magic foo foo dust, and he said his garden looks good. Well, that's pretty good, right there, fella. That's pretty good. You, you're doing good work in the community, man. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And uh, I do want to uh, mention I was in Monroe, Louisiana, uh, last week, and uh, the the whole town is covered with this rose called Peggy Martin. Uh, but I also went to Natchez, and uh, I got to share a stage with Ralph Null, uh, who was my first ever university professor. Taught me floral design and uh, landscape design. Ralph Null, he was just a hero of mine. Uh, but also, I got to stay at a at a, a B and B called Greenlee. Stella and Philip Carvey, fabulous home and garden, and had some fat mamas tamales. Uh, just wanted to throw that out. Little shout out to Natchez. Y'all are gonna be there in a week or so, aren't you? Yeah, next. Oh wow, next uh, <laughs> next yeah. weekend with the um, antique with the antique showcase uh, coming up in the next hour. Um, they're actually going to be talking about it um, on Next Stop Mississippi. So yeah, you gonna be there. No, I'm not going to be there, but because oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> I figured, you know, I figured my doctor told me I shouldn't eat a dozen tamales at a time anymore. But I'm thinking a half a dozen fat mama's tamales keeps me cheery and juicy. Uh, fat mama's tamales <laughs> are good. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I found if you don't eat, eat at least half a dozen, you get grouchy and you get wrinkled. So I'm sticking with my half a dozen a week. So. Anyway, uh, let's let's go down to Pascagoula and talk with Brother Daniel. Good morning, sir. How are you? Can you hear me real good? We can hear you real good, so keep it clean. All right. All right. The father of planting. That's what I call you, the father of planting. Hey, I want to I wanna thank you all. Keep, keep it going and keep the magnolias keeping strong. So we plant the good Mississippi. I wanted to find out about uh, what herbs would be good to plant together. My girl want to plant some basil with us, some, yeah. uh, some rosemary, and what else? And okay, how, how, Are they yeah, good how, plant together? how, how old is she? Uh, she's in her young 50s. Okay, here's the deal. I, I, I really like planting herbs. I, I use them, I cook with them. I think that's a great way to start new gardeners, no matter what their age is, children or, or young adults or anybody that's getting started with, with herbs. They're one of the easiest things to plant, and you can plant them all together. I've got a pot I'm going to show uh, off the back of my truck this morning. I put an old wash pot for my grandmother's day. She had a hole in the bottom of an old kitchen wash pot, and I just fill it with dirt. I've got rosemary. I've got oregano. I've got uh, basil. I've got, let's see what else. i got thyme uh, all in one pot. So you stick a whole bunch of stuff together, and, and most of it will live. And if something doesn't make it, nobody can tell. So just stick a whole bunch of it together and don't worry about what, like, you know, they'll figure a way to get along is what I'm saying. That sounds good. I like that. That's the magnolia. That's us right here. We have a bunch of herds. Something doesn't make it. Nobody can. Yeah, and I, I tell you something else you could do, and get her to do this too. This is what uh, this is not horticulture. What I'm about to tell you is pure gardening. Have her put something in it that's not a plant. Uh, in my little herb garden, I took uh, three branches off of crepe myrtle tree. I spray painted them green. I stuck that up in there. But you could put a you know a, a rock. You could put a, a, a bottle on a stick. But some kind of little accessory, something you know, any kind of little garden ornament. It'll make her smile uh, while she's waiting for everything to start growing. Always put something ornamental in any kind of collection of plants. It, just a stick will do. We appreciate Brother Daniel for um, calling. He He's a frequent on um, Dr. Butcher's show. And, yes, just like uh, he said, we are a bunch of herbs growing all together. But, uh, Felder, yeah. let's stay on the Gulf Coast, and let's go to Shelly in Gulfport. Hey, Shelly, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. Thank you. I wanted to find out. I had two crepe myrtles that were planted really too close to my house, close to uh -huh. 20 years ago, that I right. had I had them removed. 
they ground the stumps probably like 12 to 18 inches deep. And then Still I went behind up. them and dug up all the roots that I could and locate. It's still so coming I, up. No, it hasn't had a chance. It's only been a week. Um, <laughs> but how close, <laughs> how close to where the crepe myrtles were uh, can I plant? I'd like to put sunshine ligustrium, but I want to plant them in the right spot for the best chance for success. Right. Well, the sunshine, I have a sunshine ligustrum, by the way, growing in the back of my pickup truck. I keep it become a pickup truck at John Deere Green. It needs a little streak of yellow because that's what John Deere does. But I keep it pruned a light little, tight little golden uh, yellow ball. Uh, you can plant those pretty much anywhere, but where the stump was ground out, it's got a lot of dirt in it, but it's a lot of bark and, and wood chipped up in it. And over the next two or three or four years, all that bark is going to basically decompose. And uh, by the way, if you hear hear something really weird, sound like a helicopter standing outside of the Veterans Center here. But in, anyway, uh, if you'll move over just a foot or two away from all that, uh, then it'll be better dirt. Because right now, that's mostly bark and chewed up wood and a little dirt mixing. And it's going to sink down over the next two or three years. So okay. if you could, But now another thing you could do is if you go to a garden center and find a place that sells real topsoil i don't mean bark and stuff but real it, it dirt just real dirt and put it on top of where they they uh, ground out that stuff and dig it in in other words add some dirt to it then it'll sort of help it fill in as the thing decomposes and you can plant right there but you just need to add some real dirt to compensate for all that bark that's going to decompose and sink down i if i added the real topsoil i could plant in the basically the same spot Right, right. I'll put it on top and sort of dig it in a little bit uh, so right. that it's, you know, and it'll be raised up like a baseball pitcher mound. So plant a little bit on the high side, and as, a, as that soil settles, the plant will settle down with it. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Okay. I had a lot of Indian hawthorns across the front of my house that I did the rejuvenation pruning. Right. Most, most but not all, were coming back, but they were covered with leaf spots. Oh, so boy, I, that's a hard one. Right. So I dug all of those up. And I wanted to plant compact distillium in in that I, same area. I, but I I'm don't, having a hard time finding the distillium. The compact. I, the, okay. Now here's, I see a lot of pros and cons about distillium. It's a fairly new plant. A lot of people swear by it. A lot of people don't have good success with it. So what I would suggest be plant something that's more durable and mix it when you find the distillium because it's such an interesting contrasting shape. Sort of put them in with some other plants. You know, instead of having the same shape all the way across, put two or three, you know, put something around, something spiky. In other words, mix shapes up so that that way if something doesn't make it, it all still looks good. But if you plant all the same stuff, you're sort of asking for one of them to look better or worse than all the rest. So think about adding some of those here and there as accents to something that is a little bit that, that we that we can depend on until we figure out how well the distillium does on the coast. Do you recommend something that I would add in? Well, you know, one of my favorite go-to plants, and this is not a native plant, but it's a great one that grows in any kind of condition, uh, are the dwarf type nandinas now there's a nandina that's called harbor dwarf there's one called gulf stream and those only get about two two and a half feet tall and they're they look good all year kind of a feathery uh texture they look good they got color and then whatever you plant with them automatically looks better because it's a contrasting shape but they look the truly dwarf nandinas are pretty good go-to plant to start with even though they're not native they're awful durable awful pretty all right. Well, I thank you for the information. Okay. Look forward to, to let let us know how it works. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Bye bye. Oh, Java, got to mention something. Go ahead, Felder. We've got we've had several calls now about people wanting to plant uh, different kind of pollinators and and uh, native plants. I was at this uh, conference the, the other day. This is a, a mostly university scientists. They're they're looking for ways to find. Uh, to help urban pollinator plants. 
And what they're concentrating on is what they call the refuge lawn, where wildlife can find something to get by until summertime kicks in. In other words, uh, don't mow what's out in your yard. Let all the wildflowers in your yard go. And they're researching it and coming up with some really good ideas of things you can leave in your yard, like the clover uh, and the, the spring beauty and the dandelions and stuff like that, and then wait until till April to start mowing. So that way the wildlife has got, the pollen has got something in February and March. And then when the summertime kicks in, they can make it from there. But anyway, what they're doing, it, I learned the difference between two kinds of meadows. I'm not talking about lawn with flowers in it. A lot of people want to have a meadow lawn, but meadows are knee deep. They got ticks and snakes and stuff in them. Uh, and most people want a real lawn. But if you want a meadow, perennial meadow, keep in mind there's two kinds. The one you see along the interstate, all those beautiful flowers that get about oh, knee high or so. But the perennial native meadows, which are best for our pollinators, they got grasses and all sorts of stuff. They're not pretty to look at, but they're better. What most people want is to plant a bunch of pretty flowers like zinnias or, or stuff like that. That's a, an annual meadow, and basically all it is is a big old flower bed. A lot of people, that's how you throw a bunch of seed out and take it from there. Nope. If you want pretty flowers all the time, uh, you need to replant them every year. If you want a nice meadow, just understand it's going to look kind of ragged, but we've got all sorts of plants that will grow out there uh, throughout the whole year uh, rather than all one big show. So anyway, annual flower meadow with mostly pretty things versus a perennial native meadow a lot of diversity not great looking all the time and that's where putting a hard feature like a split rail fence or an urn or scarecrow or some birdhouses something like that out there to make it look like you know what you're doing that's my rant I'm did done with you my say rant job. Did, did you say an urn urn yeah i don't mean something like you put cream ains in i'm talking about like a big pot Oh, okay. You got to get me together, cause I'm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, you know, it looks like a big old pot. Okay. Uh, eat, okay. A, a rock, anything, but put something hard feature out there. A wagon wheel, anything to make it look like it's supposed to look like that. It interprets it for the neighbors. So anyway, I hear some music. You telling me it's time for the cheesy tune? Yeah, we're gonna take a quick break. We got a full bank of calls, so we're gonna play a little cheesy tune. Let you relax for a few seconds, and then come All back. Right. Okay, I'm getting ready to give a talk here at the Veterans Center in Hattiesburg, just on the western edge of uh, University of Southern Mississippi campus. Got my truck out there. Hope some of y'all come out. It's going to start around 10, 15 or so, and we'll be here till about, oh, 11 or 11.30 at the most. Anyway, we'll be right back with more of the Gestalt Gardener right here on Mississippi Public Broadcasting right after this. Do you drive a vehicle? Then you'll find AutoCorrect helpful especially on Coach Charlie's Tip of the Week. Listen to our podcast with me, Coach Charlie Melton, on any podcasting platform or on the MPB Public Media app. Okay, dokie folks, welcome back to Horticulture with Phil Russian. And before we go to the phone call job, i got to give a shout-out to the DeSoto Civic Garden Club in Hernando. They hosted me uh, this uh, the other day. And it was a huge, huge crowd. I mean, it, the place was just packed. Uh, wonderful uh, food. Uh, it was their 20th anniversary. But I want to give a special shout out uh, for the, the lady named Jennifer who decorated the stage. She had a mock cabin with Gestalt Gardener written on it and a bottle tree and flowers galore. Anyway, it was like I was sitting on my own front porch giving a talk. And uh, one last shout out Northwest Community College. Well, which hosted the uh, Refuge Lawn Conference, the food in the cafeteria was knocked out. Those kids eat a whole lot better than I did when I was at Mohead back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> they know how to eat now, man. So anyway, who we got? Oh, Jim and Madison, right? Yes, sir. Jim and Madison, welcome to the show. Thank you. Felder, I occasionally buy my white flowers at the grocery store here in Madison, and I always like to get an orchid because they last about a month instead of a week, and they're yeah. very beautiful. Cool. But, you know, in, in, inevitably they tend to dry up and uh, after the flowering is over, and I throw them away. And I keep thinking, there gotta be, do you have any tips about how to keep orchids alive? I know we don't have an uh, environment for orchids around here. Yeah, well, and, and by the way, we do have wild orchids in Mississippi, but they're not those pretty ones like you buy at the florist. Uh, a couple of things. these uh, They naturally grow in trees in the jungle. 
and uh, and any way you can make them think they're in a tree in a jungle, they'll do better. Which means they don't like hot sun, but they need some light. So they need to put them near a window. I've seen and I've seen orchids growing in pots in windows in Wales in Scotland. So we know we can do it. But the the idea is to uh, to give them uh, uh, bright light. And then make sure the air conditioner and heater's not blowing on them because that sucks the humidity out. So if you can put them in a, like a kitchen window or a bathroom window, someplace where there's high humidity and bright light, they have a whole lot better chance. Main thing is just out of a draft and close to a window. And also because they don't have real roots, you know, they need they, they don't need to be watered a lot in potting soil. You know, they have roots that grow around just chunks of bark and stuff. So you don't have to water them a lot. Just got to keep them humid. What about uh, the blooming? Is there a natural cycle? Is there anything we can do to force that? There is, uh, and there's different environmental things that stimulate the flower. In the tropics, they can bloom year-round, but different ones bloom, you know, they take a rest period. And there's there's so many different types of orchids. Some bloom on little spurs where the flowers were the, the year before. Some bloom on new growth. So it really just depends on what kind of orchid it is. Uh, if you can find the name of it, or, or send me a picture. Uh, uh, if I don't know, I know some people who grow orchids uh, who can help us both out. But it, it just it depends on the depends on the variety. Great, I appreciate it. Thank you. You bet, Jim. And uh, by the way, you were raised right. <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that, but I hope so. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, man. Appreciate your call. So what's up, Java? Who we got next? Coming up next, we got Andrew in Ocean Springs. Okay, going down the Gulf Coast. Andrew, what's going on? Hey, Felder. Uh, Andrew Marsh. I'm an ER doc down on the coast. Um, yeah. Uh, I think I misheard you. I think you said 250 years, but I think it's actually the 150-year anniversary of the Revolution. Uh, 1976 was, was only 50 years ago. but uh, So I might have misheard you, though. Uh but um, well, I, I got no, I, I got to do my math. But we're talking about the 1770s, right? So I think it's 150. Because remember, 18, the centennial 70, was 19, in 1976, so it's 150 years coming up. Okay, okay. Well, I, I don't do math very good, but some some uh, uh, one of my groups of ancestors, because of Jersey settlers, they came down to what's now Natchez and founded a place called Kingstown or Kingston uh, in 1773, and we just celebrated our 250th anniversary. So anyway, I don't want to get into that. Let's 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 stick to gardening. Yes, sir. The uh, so no, I'm, I apologize. The ferns, I guess, is my question. I, you know, I've got the, the the ferns out on the porch, and yeah. and they get they got. I mean, it was not a particularly hard winter this year, but it got bur- the ferns got burned. Yeah, and, they'll do uh, that. So they got burned back, and I was wondering how do you get them to re- recuperate or c- recover? Well, and, and I, don't know, I don't know what kind of ferns you got, but it's a Boston-type ferns, a typical hanging basket kind of ferns. They do not yes, like sir. the winter. Yeah, they do not like the winter at all, even on the coast, but because they get damaged when it gets down below oh, uh, 40, 35, or 40, they get damaged. What you can do is, uh, and this sounds harsh, and you can do half the plant at a time or one plant at a time, but just cut it back. And then give it a little bit of fertilizer and water, and they'll put up all new growth within days. Uh, so you can either cut part of them back or cut, you know, if you got more than one pot, you know, cut. But anyway, cut them back, get rid of the brown stuff, which is sort of like plucking eyebrows. And then uh, right. a little fertilizer, a little liquid fertilizer and some water, and they'll put out all new growth. Okay. Okay. And How do you prevent and, it in the wintertime, I guess? Got to bring them in, get them out, get them out of the, the cold. You know, the, yeah. Okay. And uh, there are there are some ferns that are evergreen you can put out there, but most of the Boston type ferns, uh, even on the coast, they're going to get burned and brown. Every now and then, you got to cut them back. Whether it's uh, you know, and if you're an ER doctor, you've got the right kind of scissors to just snip out the brown ones and leave the green ones. It just takes you <laughs> yeah. time. Okay. Okay. We'll do. Okay. Appreciate your call, Doc. Oh, by the way, next Appreciate time it. you're. Next time you head north, uh, go across the interstate. Check check out the uh, shed barbecue. It can't be beat. Oh yeah, nope. <laughs> See you, guy. I appreciate you, sir. Yep, take care. All righty, Java. What's up? 
So before we get to our next two callers, and we have a couple of phone lines um, open if anybody wants to call before the end of the show, i got to say thank you again to our podcast sponsor, uh, Varicosity Vein Center. They're sponsoring this episode's podcast, which will be available on all podcasting um, platforms, including the MPB public media app. And for more information about the Varicosity Vein Center, um, visit varicosityveincenter.com. But let's get back to the phones because right now we got Gene in Mobile wants to talk about, I think it's pomegranates. Pomegranates. Good morning, Gene. How are you, Gene? Hey. What's up, man? Howdy. I'm doing, doing fine. I'm just, I need some information. I've got a pomegranate tree I've had for years, and I called you a couple of times through the years. And uh, they, they have plenty of flowers on there. They have plenty of food on there. But when you get ready to pick them, they're rotten. Yep. Yeah, pomegranates are susceptible to a fungal disease, sort of like peaches and plums, you know, get diseases when the fruits get ripe. And there's not much you can do unless you're willing to spray fungicides ahead of time. But it's because of our hot summer nights. And pomegranates are, are native to a drier climate. It's not so much humidity. And we get a lot of humidity all night long and a little rain. It's perfect conditions for different fungi to grow. And uh, that's yeah. the reason, you know, pe- peaches and pomegranates, and they all get this sort of a brown rot. The uh, only way around it is to thin the tree out, thin out some of the limbs so you got better air circulation so the fruit doesn't stay wet as much. Because uh, other than that, you'd have to spray with fungicides, and who wants to do that? Well, so I don't just, necessarily want to do that. I've had this thing about 30 years. I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> and my, my yeah. wife loves to pick the flowers off of there. <laughs> she don't well, care about well, the well, uh, when, you know, when the, when the when the flowers fall, you know, when she when the flowers shed, you know, which is a big part. Of, even if you don't get pomegranate, it's a beautiful plant. Those kind of orange red oh, flowers. I, yeah, absolutely beautiful. Yeah, yeah. If you'll thin out some of the branches, even then, it's just so that so that the pomegranates are left, uh, got some elbow room, so air can flow around a little bit better. You'll have less less conditions for the diseases. That might help. Well, I also got one on the other side of my yard. They come from that tree over there, and got over through this about 150 feet before that tree's at. And I was backing out my driveway one day, I said, dang gum, there's a, there's a pomegranate tree there. And the damn thing ain't got pomegranates on it. <laughs> so wow, I guess it just, wow. I guess, it, I guess it'll work all right, won't it? Yeah, and what you know what commercial fruit growers do? They prune their 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 fig trees. I mean, their uh, yeah, their figs and their peaches and plums. They thin them out so that you don't have as mu- many branches as much fruit, but what's left gets bigger and uh, less likely to get disease. So commercial growers always thin stuff out. It's sort of like plucking eyebrows. Nobody wants those big old bushy things. Thin some of that stuff out. Oh, well, these old men, we like ours sticking up like antennas, you know. Yeah, hey, uh, um, out of our ear, I'll, out of our ears too. But Job is too young to understand that. <laughs> you figure it out. <laughs> okay, appreciate it, man. Good luck. All right, man. man. Thank you. Bye-bye. And by the way, Job, I mentioned uh, that I had my house repainted. It's uh, it's purple and red. Actually, it's periwinkle and raspberry. But when I looked at the names of the colors, it was the purple stuff is called childish, uh, childish wonder. And the purple stuff was called obsession. So I'm calling it periwinkle and raspberry rather than obsession and childhood wonder. Now, I can tell you, I've I've spent too much time in the paint section of the of the big box stores because I know what childish wonder looks like. <laughs> well, that's what it lo- I, and, uh, if anybody's not sure, it looks purple. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. Looks- Let's go to uh, Rebecca in Fulton now. Hey, Rebecca, what's going on way up north? Oh, uh, well, we finally got spring. And, uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, it, you know, it, it, did, did you get frost this past this past week? Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. the reason I'm asking because Java and I were talking, somebody said if it thunders in February, you'll get frost in April. And I said, ain't no way, and darn if it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> So what's, what's, what's up? What you got today? Okay, I um I I have been planting. Uh, I have been raising African violets since I was a kid. My, you know, you're talking about teaching your your granddaughter about stuff. I, um, my grandmother taught me how to root um African violet leaves. Right, right. Yeah. So, so a friend of mine gave me a couple of them, you know, to start, but. Usually, I use 
go smaller leaves so that they can get a, a good start. And she gave me some larger ones, and I'm just hoping that they'll that they'll do okay. I don't know, but they're they're by the sink, so they've got nice lighting with a grow right. light and, right. and humidity. So yeah, um, but but I've got one that's just not wanting to. You know, I, I don't know if it's just too far gone or what, but it, it was a variegated leaf, and I just cannot get it. I don't know. Maybe I'm losing my patience with it. I don't know. But, well, um, it, it, and if you, it, by the way, my grandmother, uh, not not Granny with the concrete chicken, but my, my other grandmother, she was a garden club lady. She had blue ribbons on her African violets. When she passed away, I actually had her African violet stand for a long time. And she did this all the time, but uh, she said they don't always root. You know, so it's just the luck of the draw. You know, even the best gardeners, it ain't going to work for some folks and, or some leaves or some times of the year. So there's too many different factors. It's not unusual to, to, to not have 100% success. Okay. Sometimes it's just um, the way it is. You know, a different time of the year, different conditions. Di- you know, there's all sorts of factors. Uh, and it could be the condition of the leaf or the age of the leaf. But, you know, you, you, you just root what you can, do the best you can, and just move on. Okay. Okay. And try, well, and try again. Yeah, okay. try again. Well, I will. I think I'm going to go someplace. Um, I, I don't know exactly where in my area, but I want to find a uh, um of uh, uh, an African violet with variegated leaves, I think it's pretty. Yeah, oh, well, it is. And sometimes they have pink variegation. They're awful pretty. By the way, is Fulton is that the town that's got the great big uh, uh, statue creature made out of tires? Uh, no. Okay, uh, well, so one of the, one of the towns I was driving through up there in your part of the country had a big old. I mean, we're talking about a twenty-five foot. Uh, statue made out of tires. In, anyway, yeah, just keep trying. I bet you, if you were, uh, are you familiar with Mississippi Gardening Facebook? Yes, I'm on there. I'm on there. Put put a put a request out. Anybody's got variegated African violet leaves, and I bet you they come out of the woodwork. Okay. okay. All righty. You, so you bet. Have fun. Okay, now I'll fly down to Louisville and talk to Charlene. Hey, Charlene, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Doing pretty good. Getting ready to give a talk, though, in a few minutes. What you got going on? Tell me how to cut back my azaleas. Okay. You uh, keep, keep in mind, what I'm about to tell you, I've done countless times, and it always works. You can cut an azalea down to a foot tall, a, a six-foot azalea. You can cut it to a foot or two tall if you want to, and it'll sprout back out. So don't be afraid to cut it too far. But when you cut it back really, really hard, it's going to take a few weeks for the new growth to come out. And when it does, it's really important to snip the tips off the new growth so it branches out instead of shooting up overhead again. So cut it as far as you want and then tip prune the new growth. And as long as you don't do any pruning past about the end of July, they have plenty of time to set buds for the next year. So hard pruning now, light pruning once or twice until the middle of, of July, and they'll do just fine. They really will. That'll do it. Thank you. Okay, Charlene. Hey, by the way, I had a wonderful time at the at the library there a couple of weeks ago giving a talk. I always have fun in in uh in uh oh, forgot the name of the county, Winston County. Winston County, yes. Oh, all righty. Well, appreciate your call, Charlene. All right. Bye. Okie dokie. Uh, Java. It's a rock and roll show, man. It is. You know, I was telling somebody the other day, everybody says every spring always looks better than the spring before. They always say the flowers look a whole lot better than they ever did. And this year, I think they do. And then I realized, somebody pointed out, no, Felder, you had your cataracts fixed. Of course, things look better. (laughs) (laughs) The blues are bluer, the greens are greener because of my cataracts. It ain't because of the weather. (laughs) I do want to apologize to uh, Mike from Flowwood. We ran out of time and, uh, We'll try to get you on the next episode. We'll catch them next week. Catch them next week. But I've had a good time. About to give a talk in 30 minutes or so here at the Veterans Center uh, in Hattiesburg, just on the western edge of the USM campus. Pretty day. We've got all sorts of fun folks back in my pickup truck. If you get a chance, this is a great weekend to take yourself and any kids, if you got them, to a garden center. 
to go certainly to a farmer's market, but go to a garden center, get a big old pot you can barely put your arms around, fill it with some potting soil, stick some culinary herbs and a couple of flowers and some kind of little hard feature, a gnome or something, and uh, show kids how to do what we do best, and that's get dirty. We're going to take a break. It's called a week. And we'll be back same time, same place. Meanwhile, you can always listen to the podcast anytime, MPB, w, whatever, mpbonline.org. Stay tuned for Next Stop Mississippi. <laughs> I would say looking around the state. 